Bibles am I on, brother? Okay, go to Revelation chapter 6. We're going to pick up where we left off last time. And i uh, going to do a little bit of an overlap here because there are some notes that I wanted to get to. Um, Anna, did one of you guys bring that uh, Bible that I asked you to bring? I talked to Sophia. Could, would you mind running out and grabbing it for me? Thank you, hon. Um, so I want to show you some things that um, I kind of had let there be light. Thanks, Rob. Uh, that I had kind of glossed over last week, but I think are very important to um, understanding what we're dealing with doctrinally here in Revelation chapter 6. Look down there with me, if you would, at verse number 8. It says, And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. And uh, we had talked about how, um, how many people there is on the planet right now. Remember that? And I showed you the graph on how kind of level uh, population had been, and then it just starts spiking, and then as it starts going up, it just goes up more and more and more. And uh, if the Lord tarries any length of time at all, um, fourth part of the people on the earth is a whole lot of people that are dead. Yes, thank you. Appreciate it. And so we're t looking at, a, that's why the Bible calls us the time of great tribulation. We're looking at a pretty severe um, worldwide plague, a worldwide uh, a massive, massive problem going on. And the scary thing is, that's not the first. When you look at this, a uh, fourth part being killed in verse number 8, but you already have had people dying before you got to that verse. Uh, remember in verse number 2, if you would, he said, There's a white horse, and him that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And I pointed out to you that that is not Jesus Christ, no matter what all these theologians tell you. Uh, Brother Brian was texting me uh, this afternoon uh, some pages from uh, his JW book. And they say that this is Jesus Christ. Well, everything that follows when this guy on a white horse comes out isn't anything like what follows Jesus Christ when he comes. So that can't be the truth. Look at Revelation chapter 9. Right, so you got you got something coming out here that's bringing a whole bunch of death uh, with them. Revelation nine eleven. Now here's a real interesting thing. We'll get into this in more detail later, but we're talking about hell here, and it says they had a king uh, over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, and the Greek tongue hath his name Apollyon. Abaddon and Apollyon both mean perdition. So in the tribulation period, back over to Revelation chapter 6, when the Antichrist comes, he comes conquering and to conquer, and then behind him comes famine, and, and there's war, and there's death, and all this stuff is building up. In verse 5, he comes with a pair of balances, right? And then in verse 6, you're looking at a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny, and hurt not the oil and the wine. And remember, we talked about that. So there's some people in the tribulation period who are rich. And yet there's plagues spreading throughout the earth and famine throughout the earth and death throughout the earth. And before you get to this part where a fourth part of them in verse number eight die, you already have people dying from famine and dying from war. Uh, it's a pretty wild scene you're dealing with. How they get that this thing in verse number two is Jesus Christ coming back, I can't, I can't imagine. I don't know how stupid these theologians can possibly be. I guess they spend all their time studying Hebrew and Greek and not any time studying the Bible that they've got. The Bible you got in your lap is perfect just like it is. God promised that he would preserve it from this generation forever, right? So these guys are obsessed with the Hebrew and the Greek, and, and they are obsessed with you knowing how smart they are and how educated they are, but they're not obsessed with the Bible they got. They believe God inspired it in the originals, but they don't believe that God preserved it. If God inspired it in the originals and promised he'd preserve it, then if he preserved something inspired, guess what you've got if you're holding the Bible in your lap? It's inspired. So you need to understand that the inspired Word of God, and I'm, I'm going somewhere with this, you need to understand that the inspired Word of God in your day and in your age is a King James Bible. We don't just say that because we're ignorant and we're stubborn and we got caught up in some cult or we're following a man. You can call me a Ruckmanite all you want. I'm totally good with it. I could care less. I'm not ashamed of it. 
but it's not because I just blindly follow a man. If I was going to follow a man, that'd be the one I'd follow. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, I like a preacher that's a real man. I, I just, I like that. And I didn't feel like there's anything about him that was slimy. Nothing about him was manipulative. Nothing about him was trying to get anything out of anybody. He was just trying to get everybody everywhere he went the truth. And he loved the Bible. I thank God for that. So, yeah, you know, I'm a Ruckmanite. But I'm not a Ruckmanite because I'm blind to following a man. I found a man that believed the Bible. And he trained some men who trained me. Thank God for them. So when you got a King James Bible, you got the inerrant, infallible, and inspired words of God. And these, these, these guys that don't believe the Bible come in here and can't make sense out of anything. They're telling you that's Jesus Christ with what follows him when he comes. He's got a bow. Well, when Jesus Christ comes, he doesn't have a bow. He has a sword. And when Jesus Christ comes, the armies which are in heaven, we'll see it as we go through Revelation, the armies which are in heaven follow him. What follows this guy is famine, war, death, and hell. That's verse 8. So you've already had people dying, and we're wrapping it up now. Tonight we're going to come down to the end of the tribulation period, because this is the first run through of the tribulation. And already before you get to this point, people are dying of starvation, people are dying from war, and then from that point when death and hell show up, it looks like another fourth part of the earth. That's billions of people dying. Now, look at verse 8. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and hell followed with him. And power was given uh, unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, that's war, and with hunger, that's famine, and with death. That looks like it's random. All kinds of death. And with the beast of the earth. So when this person, it's, it's, a, it's a person's name, I looked, and behold, a pale horse. He sees a horse. And his name that sat on the horse was death. His name was death. This is an individual sitting on a horse named death. So who is that? That's wild, isn't it? And then it says, and hell followed with him. So from what we can study, and I'll show you some verses, but hell seems to be personified right there. But it's sitting on a horse personified. There's something coming up. And we're going to show you as we continue through Revelation, there's some actual beasts coming out of hell. Some, some, some strangely mutated animals, some strangely mutated beasts coming up out of hell. That actually is going to tie into your Greek mythology like you ever never seen in your life. It's wild how they teach all this Greek mythology and all the rest of that stuff and where they get this stuff from, while at the same time they say they don't believe the Bible and don't follow God and none of that stuff is real, but they're coming up with all this stuff that's been out there for a long time and it's all rooted in the scriptures. You got some wild stuff coming out and it's all demonic, it's straight from the devil and it's right out of the pits of hell and it's as real as you're sitting there. So death shows up here, and hell's following with them. And what they do is they come and they bring the sword, they bring hunger, and they bring death. And with the beasts of the earth. You know what starts happening as you get to the tribulation period? All of nature is turned upside down. Everything's backwards. Do you know God put naturally in the animals a fear of man? Ladies, I hate to tell you, those spiders are more scared of you than you are of them. You see a spider, you're like, ah! <laughs> you gave the thing a heart. Do you ever see what the spiders do? They run. You guys ever notice that? And while the spider is running away from you, you're going, ah! like, relax. He's more scared of you than you are of him. You can solve that problem real quickly. You understand what I'm saying? Like, God put naturally in the beasts a fear of you. You understand that? Uh, you go out there in the forest, man. Most of the time, those animals are going to get away from you. They're going to run from you. Snakes, generally speaking, run from you. It's pretty rare that a snake comes after you like a rattlesnake's like, I got a great idea. I'm going to go bite that human and then slither off. I mean, you're way too big to eat. Why would they mess with you? They generally want to get away from you. It's if you surprise them, scare them, step on them, and they didn't see you coming that they defend themselves and they quickly lash out and bite. But for the most part, they're, they're afraid of you. You understand that? Well, as you get closer to the coming of Jesus Christ, I think you're going to see some of it happening. And definitely when we get into the tribulation period, the beasts of the earth are attacking the human beings. Now, that's a pretty wild thing because in Revelation, the God talks about um, um, when, when men no longer like to retain God in their knowledge, right? 
God gives them over to a reprobate mind. And what they do instead of evolution is devolution. We devolve as you reject God and don't want God in your knowledge. You go the opposite direction. We're not getting better. We're not evolving. We're actually falling apart if you haven't noticed. We kick God out of the schools. We kick God out of the homes. We've kicked God out of the church now. We have kicked the Bible out of the church. And what happens is it all comes apart. Marriages don't last. Dads aren't good dads that love their kids and there for them. Moms are derelict and selfish and self-centered and willing to leave their kids and just abandon. They don't care what they're doing to those kids. They don't care what they're doing to their marriage. It, what it is is it's God's been kicked out of the equation. You're not following God. You better follow God. We kick God out of society and they want to kick God out of the world. And so God says, fine, you think you know how to run it better than me? Why don't you just go ahead and see what happens? And nature get flipped, gets flipped. I'm going to show you tonight. Nature gets flipped upside down. And beasts are coming after people. You're walking outside and there's stinking random deers running up and trying to headbutt you and stinking gut you in your front lawn. I ain't been afraid of a deer a day in my life. You walk outside and the neighbor's pit bulls are over there trying to eat you. You walk outside and some random cougars or coyotes come out of the woods and they're coming after you. That's the tribulation period. That's when death and hell get released on this earth. So you've got to recognize who this death is. Go with me, if you would, to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2. We've got to run some references here. So I showed you already Revelation 9, right? Revelation 9, 11. And he comes up out of the bottomless pit, and his name is Abaddon and Apollyon, which means, per, both of those mean perdition. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, look at verse 3. Let no man deceive you, for by, uh, by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Now watch this. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. As the Antichrist in the tribulation period... Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So that's why I said this morning it scares the fire out of me. Uh, well, not really, but it just uh, it was really an eye opener to me to see these people standing around singing "Amazing Grace." You know, "Twas Grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved." While they're, they're shaking their fists in the face of God and going against what he says and usurping his authority and trying to say that what God calls an abomination is okay. And they're standing there singing Amazing Grace. Who are they singing that to? You say, oh, they're singing it to God. They're singing it to Jesus Christ. Okay, then let me stand up there in the middle of that little assembly and open up a King James Bible and say, listen, folks, I want to tell you how Jesus Christ loves you. Let me just tell you about G. Can I just tell you a little bit about the Lord Jesus Christ from the Bible? I don't want your faith in a man or in a religion. I don't want you to trust me. I want, you to t I want to tell you about Jesus Christ, how he'll forgive you for your sin. And he'll save your soul. He'll wash you in his precious blood. He'll give you an eternal home in heaven. And you need to receive him by faith. And if you don't receive him by faith because of your sin, you're going to split hell wide open. Any questions? Well, what is sin? Well, how about homosexuality, according to the Bible? How about not being content with what God created you to be and saying you want to be something you're not because God didn't make you that? That's rebellion. You call it transgender. How about that? You watch what they do. You think they're receiving Jesus Christ? You think they're singing about the grace of God that, that washed away their sins? They're rubbing it in the face of God, and they're, oh, what a calming spirit. Oh, a peaceful moment in the middle of all this chaos of this cruel government not letting us manipulate kids under 18. Yeah. Folks, that ain't God. That is another spirit. That is a great falling away, but it's not the one in the tribulation. You're just in the warm-up phase. Do you understand that? This is the warm-up phase. That frog's been boiling for a long time. I am sorry, and I don't mean to disrespect older folks, but my parents' generation wrecked this world, this country. They wrecked it. He's a historian. That's why he laughed. They wrecked this country. 
And it came from their parents who said, we went through the depression and we went through World War II and we don't want our poor kids to have to deal with what we had to deal with. So we want prosperity, prosperity, prosperity. And they said, waste not, want not, and cleanliness is next to godliness and work and go get an education so you can get a good job so you don't have to suffer like we did. And then pass that on to the hippies who destroyed this country and destroyed my generation and taught us to be a bunch of hedonists and live however we want to live and do whatever we want to do and forget God. And, and we go with the science and we go with the science. We don't go with faith and the bands of faith and the bonds of faith. And we need to break the bonds that are constraining us and destroying us. And now you're seeing the fallout of that. My generation didn't have a clue how to lead the ones they're procreating into the world. They had no idea how to lead them. Have no idea how to train them. Just wrecking them. Why? Because we've lost our minds and kicked God out of everything. And so the whole thing gets turned upside down. And now you're at a point where people will stand there and they'll fall for a spirit. They'll believe a great lie and they'll sing to Lucifer and they pick the hymns. You ever seen anything so wild in your life? Why aren't they doing the 7-Eleven songs in the contemporary churches? You know what I mean? They got no substance to them. They got no doctrine to them. They're singing a doctrinally sound song to the wrong spirit. Boy sitting in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God and saying, bow to me, I'm Jesus Christ and I came to solve the problems of the world. And they're going to say, it's Jesus. And they're going to bow to him. Now I'll go over to the book of John, please. Look at John chapter number 17. John chapter 17 and look at verse 12. So I showed you Abaddon and Apollyon, right? And he comes up from the bottomless pit. He's the son of perdition. Abaddon and Apollyon mean perdition. I showed you last week in Hebrews, I think it was chapter 4. I got the reference here somewhere. I think it was Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, how uh, God destroyed him that had the power of death. That is Satan, right? So, so Satan's death. And, and the Antichrist is the son of perdition. He's coming up from the bottomless pit. He's coming out. Death and hell is coming with him in the tribulation period. Look at John 17, verse 12. We're going to identify who this guy is. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, have I, I have kept. And none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. He said, I didn't lose one of them, God, but the son of perdition is the one I lost. He told those 12, he said, but one of you is a devil. Walking around looking just like a man. He said, one of you is a devil. Now watch this. Go back to John chapter 13. John chapter 13, look at verse 26. The only time in a King James Bible this word appears is in this chapter. Now watch it. Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop. They're asking who it is that's going to betray him, right? He it is to whom I give a sop when I have dipped it. That stinking King James Bible, man, I can't understand anything. I don't know what those words are. We need to update that so it's more readable because people can't understand a King James Bible because it's so difficult. Sop. God, God, the Bible says, he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, he shall have him in derision. God laughs at those scholars. I'm telling you right now, God, 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 probably up there, he's got a sense of humor. It says, he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. Sop, that's a tough word, three letters. Right? So your new Bibles are going to help you and make it make more sense. He it is to whom I give a sop. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. And after the sop, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest do quickly. And no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him. For some of them thought, because Judas had the bag, that Jesus had said unto him, Buy those things that we have, that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. And he, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. Now watch this. I'm always telling you about the King James Bible, right? And, and I'm trying to tell you that every word of God is pure and don't mess with it even when you don't understand it. So these guys are always trying to tell you the Bible's too hard for you to understand because what they're saying is you're stupid and they're smart. I think it's insulting. 
some stupid Greek professor trying to tell me that the King James Bible is outdated and too hard to understand and it's not relevant anymore. I think it's, I think it's, I think it's patronizing. So every one of these new Bibles, I got, a, I got a linear Bible here. It's got a King James, an Amplified, a New American Standard, and a New International side by side. And I don't, I don't have this to give me more understanding on the English. I don't look at these other Bibles to, to make it make sense and then look back at the English. I look at them to criticize them. Just so you know, I'm just biased and that's the bias I'm approaching it with. Because I believe God. So look at verse 26 in this one. This is the Amplified Bible. Jesus answered, it is, one of, it is the one to whom I am going to give the morsel bit of food after I've dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel of bread into the dish, he gave it to Judas, Simon Iscariot's son. Then after he had taken the bit of food, Satan entered into him, entered into, into and took possession of Judas. Jesus said it to him, what are you going to do? What you are going to do, do more swiftly than you seem to intend and make quick work of it. <laughs> He's the one that read a man's mind and heart when the guy walked up and said, we know thou art a worker come from a miracle worker come from no man can do the miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Then thou seemest to intend this is probably that effeminate Jesus with long red hair and skinny little fingers with rainbows around him and little children and doves. That's, that's probably the one that they're referring to here. It's not the one of the King James Bible. Um, some thought that since Judas had the money box, the purse, Jesus was telling them, telling him, buy what we need for the festival or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the bit of bread, he went out immediately and it was night. You guys, these other Bibles are nowhere near as readable as the King James Bible. They're just not as readable. They don't flow. You couldn't memorize, memorize, go home and memorize the Amplified Bible, uh, John chapter 13, verses 26 through 30 for me. Then go home and memorize the King James Bible, John chapter 13, verses 26 through 30. It flows. It's a totally different work. It's got God's breath all over it. New American Standard, verse 26. Jesus therefore answered, this is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. So when he had dipped the morsel, he took and gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Uh, and, and after the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus therefore said unto him, What you do, do quickly. Now no one of those reclining at the table knew for what purpose he had said this to him. For some were supposing, because Jesus had the money box, that Jesus was saying to him, Buy the things that we have need of uh, for the feast, or else that he should give something to the poor. And so after receiving the morsel, he went out immediately, and it was night. That's your New American Standard. Who's your New International Version? Uh, Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. What you are about to do, do quickly, Jesus told him. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him, since Judas had the charge of the money. Some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the feast or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out, and it was night. What's the problem with all those? Every last one of those, what's the problem? You know what you lose? You lose a piece of revelation that you only get in the King James Bible. You lose who the son of perdition is. You know who it is? It's Judas Iscariot. The same spirit that is showing up in Revelation was in Judas at that time. Judas is the son of perdition. He handed him a SOP, a SOP. Now you say you're making more out of it. Absolutely am not. That identifies the only time in the King James Bible the word SOP shows up and it identifies what spirit was in Judas and what was going on. That is the spirit of Antichrist. And it, they tell you in, in, uh, in uh, it, uh, 1 John, I think, uh, that that spirit's already in the world. It was here back then. And he's coming back in the tribulation period. You know what Judas does? He goes out, Acts chapter 1, verse 25. Look at this. Acts 1, 25. Now watch this. This is very interesting. 
It says in Acts 1.25 that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from, with Ju from which Judas by transgression fell, watch it, that he might go to his own place. You know what his place is? It's hell. There's a king of the bottomless pit that we're going to get into more as we go through Revelation. When we run through this thing again, we're just laying some of the groundwork right now. There's a king of the bottomless pit that's coming out. He's getting released in the tribulation period, and he's bringing hell with him. He's the king over it. That's a scary thought. Go with me, if you would, please, to the book of Isaiah, chapter 28. So we're looking at death and hell, right? Isaiah, chapter 28. I want you to see verse 15. Isaiah 28, 15. So what happens in the tribulation period is people that want to survive have got to bow the knee. They've got to commit transgression. Like we talked about this morning, they have to, they're the wicked that prosper in the world. They have to make a deal with the devil. Uh, they have to get the mark of the beast, which is a hilarious thing to me how that's getting more and more common knowledge and lost people that don't know anything about the Bible know 666. Isn't that weird? You know nothing about the Bible. There is, listen, there is no other source on the planet for that number and that number to become a jinx or a hex. There's no other source on the planet for the number 13 to be considered a rebellious number or a jinx or a hex other than the Bible. That's where everybody gets it from and everybody knows that that number is a bad number. How does everybody know that? People that know nothing of God or nothing of the Bible know that those are bad numbers. Where does, that, where does that kind of knowledge come from? The word is nigh thee, even in thy heart and in thy mouth, that is the word of faith which we preach. God puts enough light in every individual to where they are responsible to seek God out and find out the truth. Isaiah chapter 28, look at this. Because ye have said, we have made a covenant with death, and with hell are we at agreement. When the overflowing scourge shall pass through, it shall not come upon unto us. We have made lies our refuge, and under falsehood have we hid ourselves. You see that? The overflowing scourge. Well, you're seeing what that is in Revelation chapter 6. You're seeing famine. You're seeing war. You're seeing the devil come. The Antichrist show up with a bow, the sign of the boatman, bringing, supposedly bringing peace. And then after he shows up and all of a sudden brings this peace on earth that we desperately need, that we desperately need. Right? And he shows up. Jesus appears. That's what's going to happen, folks. And he's going to bring in peace. And all of a sudden, then behind him, after he brings in this fake peace for a very little while, hurt not the oil and the wine, we're going to get the Muslims and the Christians together. Oil representing the Muslims, the wine representing the Christianity of the Roman Catholic Church specifically, not biblical Christianity. And we're going to get the richest people on the planet together and we're going to bring peace between them. And then what follows them is famine, unless you're in with the oil and the wine. War and death and hell. And unless you've got to deal with death and hell, you're dead. So Israel is saying here in Isaiah chapter 28, you see why you need to understand doctrine when you read your Bible and know rightly dividing? Now you read through the book of Isaiah once you understand Revelation and you understand how to rightly divide the word of truth and a lot of these passages that never made sense are going to be like, oh, I get it. You read Psalm 73, we preached this morning and you're like, oh, that's what he's talking about, the prosperity of the wicked. They're making a deal with the devil to survive the tribulation period. All right, look at Isaiah chapter 34 and verse number 8. Isaiah 34, 8. I think we saw this last time. For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance, the year of the recompenses for the controversy of Zion. The streams thereof shall be turned into pitch, and the dust thereof into brimstone, and the land shall become burning, a burning pitch. It shall not be quenched night or day. The smoke thereof shall go up forever. From generation to generation it shall lie waste. None shall pass through it forever and ever. But the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it. The owl also and the raven shall dwell in it. And he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. And they shall call the nobles thereof to the kingdom, but none shall be there. And all her princes shall be as nothing. And thorns shall come up in her palaces, nettles and brambles in the fortresses thereof. And it shall be the habitation of dragons and a court for owls. 
The wild beasts of the desert shall also meet with the wild beasts of the island, and the satire shall cry to his fellow, and the screech owl also shall, have, shall rest there and find her herself a place of rest. And there shall be the great owl make her nest and lay and hatch and gather under her shadow, and there shall be vultures also gathered, every one with her mate. You see in, you're seeing a picture of something horrendous going on, and there's beasts in it. Look at this, what's so interesting. Verse 16, Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. No one of these shall fail, none shall want her mate, for my mouth it hath commanded, and his spirit in it, and his spirit it hath gathered them. You know what you need to be doing in light of what's coming? You need to seek out the book of God and read. You better find out what's happening in the world around you. You better make sense of what's going on. It's important to know. Let me look at this reference. Yeah, I do want you to see this one. Go to Revelation 12, 9, please. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. Well, um, yeah, because we'll go in more detail later. I just want you to get this one point. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. You know what the devil's referred to as? A dragon and a serpent. That's the devil and Satan, and another name for the devil is death and perdition, hell. There's a king over that pit, and he's coming up. Abaddon and Apollyon, perdition. And that connects you to Judas Iscariot, who goes out, betrays Jesus Christ, goes out, hangs himself, and goes to his place. Isn't that wild? Pretty interesting, huh? And you can't get that from your other Bibles. When you start messing around with the Bible and saying, well, sop only appears one time, and it's an old English word that has to do with uh, anything that's dipped in a liquid or a broth or a liquor, and so, you know, nobody knows what a sop is nowadays. So let's just make it easier to understand and change it to a morsel of bread or dip the morsel or, or a piece of bread because that makes sense and it means the same thing. So let's just change the Bible. You know what you just did? You just played into the hands of the devil himself because you know what he doesn't want? He doesn't want people to be able to figure out who he is and how he works and what he's doing. Because when he shows up, he wants to throw a couple verses at them and have them all gather and start singing Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. And then he says, all right, now go on out there and find all those people that don't have a mark and bring them in here and sacrifice them. Go back to Revelation chapter 6. And they say, yes, Jesus will do it. See, you folks, you guys understand, you guys understand why I'm so dogmatic about doctrine. Why, why I, want you to, I want you to turn and see the references when I teach you the Bible. I want you to have your nose in the book. I want to give you the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Because when you just walk in and say, Jesus, 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 and you don't give any context to who he is, what Jesus Christ we're talking about, what doctrine we're referring to, who this one is and nail that thing down and understand him from the Bible, you could fall for any spirit and Satan himself appears as an angel of light and his ministers as ministers of righteousness. So what he's going to do to you when you walk into his church that claims to be Christian is he's going to give you a great feeling. You are not going to get under conviction for what you've been looking at, what you've been thinking about what you've been doing. He ain't going to bring you any conviction at all. He's going to say, it's all good, it's all fine, you're loved just like you are, you were created that way anyways, and you were, you were just, you know, God really shortchanged you when he put you in a male body. That's what he's going to, he's going to make you feel good just like you are. And then people walk into a church like this and they sit down and you open up a Bible and you start running references and something inside of them is just uncomfortable, man. And it's like, well, I don't like the fact that he yells. Well, it's probably not the yelling. I ain't been yelling tonight, have I? Have I yelled tonight? No. But boy, you get all kind of like, it don't feel good. But God loves you. And he's trying to wake you up a little bit and show you, hey, listen, you need something. You need truth. And boy, every one of these guys has gotten saved. Once they get saved, once they realize the truth and they're willing to accept it and they see what the Bible says and they, they trust Christ, I mean, like the real way, the old-fashioned way, verse by verse, knowing what you're doing. Ask Jesus Christ. They're like, 
whoa, I feel like, I feel like somebody took a truck off me. I feel like somebody backed a truck off my back, man. That's an amazing thing. But nowadays, people don't want it. They're, they're getting lulled to sleep by the wrong spirit. So what's coming out is death and hell. Now look at verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them what were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. Now, what you got here when you open up the fifth seals is souls under the altar. These souls have been murdered. They've been killed. What's well, happened, and again, we're laying the groundwork, so we'll get into it more as we go through here, I believe. But what has happened is that they've been brought into this temple and they've been slain in front of the Antichrist as a sacrifice. Literally in the tribulation period, they're offering human beings on an altar to the devil in the temple. I showed you in 2 Thessalonians, he enters in a temple of God and is sitting there showing himself that he is God. He's saying, I'm Jesus and I've come back. And here I am now. And what I want from you good people is go out there and find everybody that doesn't have my mark on them. And you bring them in here and chop their head off. I want their blood. What they're going to do is they're going to be serving the devil and thinking that when they crucify those people that are following the everlasting gospel, we'll get to that in a little bit. It's not the gospel of the grace of God. It can't be. The church is gone. It's a different gospel in the tribulation period. They're actually told to repent. And they have to be baptized to wash away the mark. If they've received the mark already, the only chance they have of getting that mark washed away once they've received it is baptism. Like Naaman, the leper. Like Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. So baptism comes back into the picture in the tribulation period. The everlasting gospel is endure to the end. He that endureth to the end shall be saved. And if you already messed up and took the mark, you better get down there. You better trust Jesus. You better go get baptized and get that thing washed off. A lot of people don't know that. They run to Acts 2.38 and think that that has to do with you being baptized for salvation. That was nationally being preached to Israel. I'll show you in just a second. So... First thing I want you to see is back here in Revelation chapter, chapter 6. Go over to Revelation uh, uh, 20. I, no, um, yeah, I think it's Revelation 20. Hold on. The soul's under the altar. Yeah, Revelation 20 verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them. So now hang on a second. Now what we're seeing is thrones in heaven, and this is prior to the second advent, right? Uh, he sees the angel come down with the key of the bottomless pit and all that thing right there. These thrones are in heaven now. These souls are in heaven that had been beheaded. So somewhere between the tribulation period, so the rapture of the church has already taken place, right? Now we go into the tribulation period and there's souls under the altar waiting to go to heaven because they can't get there yet. God's making them wait. But now we get over to Revelation chapter 20 and the souls that had been waiting under the altar are in heaven. So there's a rapture somewhere between the rapture of the church and the second advent. It's a rapture toward the end of the tribulation. You know how many churches are, oh, well, we're pre-trib rapture. Well, we're mid-trib rapture. Well, we're post-trib rapture. And they all run to verses in the Bible to try to show you proof that they believe the rapture is happening here and not there. And then they pull a verse out of context that's actually to the Jews in the tribulation period. And they think that that rapture has to do with you and me. You understand what I'm saying? Folks, you're, supposed, you're told to rightly divide the word of truth. Are you pre-trib, mid-trib, or post-trib? Yep. <laughs> it depends on who we're talking about getting raptured. God covers all those bases. So those souls that were beheaded in the tribulation period, when you get over to Revelation chapter 20, they are, they're on thrones in heaven. And I saw thrones... And they sat upon them, and the judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, nor in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. You see how those people are killed? 
in Revelation chapter 6, those are the souls under the altar. They're bringing them out to the altar in front of Lucifer, in front of the Antichrist, while he's sitting on the throne saying, I'm God. And they're saying, here's one that don't have the mark and won't take the mark. Why won't you take the mark? Because Jesus Christ is my Savior according to the Word of God. And I got the testimony of Jesus, and I'm not taking a mark and, and damning my soul just to eat. And they're taking those scrawny, skinny, dirty, unshaven, messed up. I mean, they've been living out there trying to survive in the devil's world, man. And they're taking them there, laying them down on that altar, just whack, cutting that head off of that sacrifice. Just like they did in the Old Testament. They cut the heads off the sacrifices. They cut the head off that human sacrifice. And that soul stays down there under the altar. God puts it somewhere. It can't go quite to straight to heaven right now. Those souls are waiting. And Lucifer's like, thank you for the worship. Next. And they're thinking, they're thinking that they're doing God a favor because they're thinking that's God. They're sacrificing people that won't take the mark too. So they're sacrificed by beheading. Now, some things you need to understand about a soul. The difference between you and an animal. Ladies, I hate to break your hearts. Your dogs are a dichotomy. They have a body and they have a spirit. Understand? They don't have a soul. I'm sorry. Your cats are only a spirit. Demonic spirit. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm playing. I'm playing. Mrs. Naholvik, please don't leave the church mad. Your cats are a dichotomy. Listen, I'm, I'm playing, but cats are like my, my daughter said the other day, like, Dad, you were busting on cats, but what's your favorite animal? Like a lion? Like, you know that's a cat, don't you? I'm like, yeah, shut up, kid, you know? Um, I, would, I would have one if I wasn't highly allergic to their hair, like really bad, but they are actually a pretty cool animal. So, but it's just fun doing the whole dog and cat thing. So, Anyhow, they're a dichotomy. A bird is a dichotomy. It's a body and a spirit. So they have instincts in them. So what makes a dog act like a dog and a cat act like a cat and a bird act like a bird? It's the spirit in them. It's an instinct in them. It's the life from God. You as a human being, you're a trichotomy. You have a body. That's what you and I see. You have a soul and you have a spirit. Your soul is not your spirit. Your spirit's not your soul. Your body's not either. So that's why you have the ability to reason, to get imaginative, to learn things, to communicate, to think about stuff. Because God made man in his own image and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. So what he did is he made you a trichotomy like the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. A spirit you can't see. It's the life force from God. It's the breath. God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. That's the spirit. It's like the old-fashioned tires that have an inner tube, right? So you've got the rubber on the outside. That's the body. And then you've got an inner tube that conforms to the shape of that tire. And then in order for that thing to actually be active, you have to breathe air into it. And when you press air into it, it expands and now it's alive and it's active. So when you die, your spirit and your soul leave your body. But your soul, you have to understand this, your soul has eyes, a nose, mouth, arms, legs, a head, a torso, feet. Your soul is a bodiless form. Ain't that wild? Go to Luke chapter 16. Let me show you. Luke chapter number 16. Verse 19, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously it, uh, every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus who was at his, laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, not heaven. In the Old Testament, they didn't go to heaven. They went to Abraham's bosom in the heart of the earth. Jesus Christ hadn't died on the cross yet and made a way for them to go to heaven. So when they died in the Old Testament, they went to Abraham's bosom. So in the center of the earth, you had a Grand Canyon, a great gulf fix on one side's hell and on the other side's paradise or Abraham's bosom. 
And what happened is, since this is the Old Testament, the angels come and they carry this man to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lift up his eyes being in torments. Hell's not just a place to torment. It's a place of torments. And seeth Abraham afar off. What did he do? Where was his body? It says it right there in verse 22, the end of the verse. Where was his body? His body's buried. It's in the ground. You can dig it up. Bust open that casket and you can see. The body's still there. But where's the man? He's in hell. And what's he doing? He's in hell looking. He can see. He's not some spirit floating around. He's actually able to observe. And he's able to feel pain. And he cries out and he says, It saith Lazar, Lazarus in Abraham's bosom, right? Seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. Man, if you're here and you're not saved, I'll feel sorry for you. Because that's where you're headed. And if you walk out of here unsaved and refuse to pray about this and ask God if you're hearing the truth and ask God to show you the truth and ask God to help you get saved, I feel even more sorry for you because the more light you have and you sin against it and push it away, the worse off you're going to be at the judgment. And I don't have time to show you, but I'm telling you the truth. People that die with very little light have a better off time than people that die with a lot of light. He cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus. I'm tormented in this flame. I think we read through the end of the verse, verse 25. And Abraham, but Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that they may testify unto them, lest they also come to this place to torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. That means they have the Bible. Moses and the prophets have been long dead. They had the Old Testament. He said, Let them hear them. He said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they'll repent. He said, If you send somebody up there with smoke coming out of, his out, out of his mouth and out of his ears. And as he <coughs> coughs, flames of smoke come out and his body's half charged and he's in a state of decomposition because he's getting a body like the devil according to Mark chapter 9. He's becoming a worm. The worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. You're getting a body if you're saved like Jesus Christ, but those in hell get a body like a worm. And he's... And he opened up the door and there's this freaky thing from another, another dimension standing in front of you saying, don't go to hell. It's all true. You better listen. You better listen. He said, then they'll get saved. Watch the response. He said to them, if they will not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded though one rose from the dead. You know what the Antichrist does? The man of sins revealed. I showed you last week. You know how he's revealed? He gets killed and he raises from the dead the third day. And the whole world goes, that's Jesus. And he rises from the dead and marches into the temple in Jerusalem over there right now and sits down in the temple and says, I'm Jesus and I'm here. And they still, they, they accept a lie. They don't believe the truth. You know what he was telling them? It's really important how they treat the Bible. The most powerful thing you can give somebody to win them to Christ is the Bible. But what I want you to see there is that a soul actually has a physical shape. Go to Genesis chapter 35, and then we'll come back over here to Revelation. Genesis chapter 35, I want you to see verse 18. Genesis 35, 18. Now Rachel's dying here, and it's giving you the account of Rachel's death. And now watch this. It says, and it came to pass as her soul was in departing, for she died. You know what the Apostle Paul said in 2 Timothy 4? He said the time of my, I think it's verse 6, he said the time of my departure is at hand. You know what he's saying? I'm leaving this body. You know what that was? It was actually Paul, the Apostle Paul. Nose, eyes, face, head, arms, hands, legs, torso, leaving the flesh that he had been living in. 
He said in uh, Philippians 1.23 that he has a desire to depart and to be with God. You know what he's saying? I want out of this and I want to go there. Now go back over to Revelation chapter 6, keeping all that in mind. These souls are under the altar, right? And so now that we're, we're past the church age and we're out here in the tribulation period, uh, the Abraham's bosom is reopened is what it looks like. God puts him in a place of rest. This is where a lot of people get this soul sleep garbage and try to tell you that when you die, your soul waits in the grave. They get verses like this totally taken out of context. This is the tribulation. This has nothing to do with the Christian. This has nothing to do with the bride of Christ or you. Paul said, willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. If you're saved now in this time frame, in this dispensation, then the second you die, you step into the presence of God. You ain't going to wait in some weird limbo state, but these guys are. So it seems like Abraham's bosom is reopened, and they're waiting there. Now, don't forget, we don't have the time to run the references, because I want to wrap this up tonight and let you get out of here. But don't forget this. When Jesus Christ died, part of the gospel is three days and three nights, right? Why is that part of the gospel? What did he do? He descended first, according to Ephesians, right? And according to 1 uh, Peter, I believe it is, it says he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. And according to Matthew, it tells you some of the bodies of the saints were slept or rose. You know what he did? He went down there and preached to those spirits that were in prison. He preached the gospel to those guys in the Abraham's bosom, and he brought them up with him. Paradise, Abraham's bosom ain't in operation right now. But it's coming back into operation in the future. Now you depart and go to be with God. But here these souls are waiting. And here's a wild thing. They're asking him how long they're going to they're gonna avenge our blood. And it says, And white robes were given unto, unto every one of them. And it was said unto them that they should rest for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren should be killed as they were. Uh, that should be killed as they were were fulfilled. You know what you do with a ghost in order to see it? A soul? Because a soul is an invisible body. You've got to put a robe on it. That's where all your little, you know, Casper the Friendly Ghost stories come from. Why, well, they always got a robe on them. Well, a man that's never seen a spirit, never seen a soul, would know that. You know where they get that stuff from? They all get it from the Bible that they claim they don't believe. Isn't that wild? It's wild, man. You know where real science comes from? Good science? It all comes from the Bible. You know, most of the modern science, people got, a lot of those guys got their idea for what they were looking for and turned out to prove from reading a Bible. Robert Murphy, I believe his name is, the father of modern oceanography, found out about rip currents because he read it in the Bible and he saw there's paths in the sea, so he figured if it's in the Bible, it must be out there, and he went and found it. The Bible's not an unscientific book. Your uneducated and biased school teachers are the ones that are trying to make you think that Christians that believe the Bible are unscientific. We're against false science. But we're not against real science. And just to show you they're in false science, they're twisting and corrupting everything and denying reality now. They deny science based on bias and preferenced opinions. Okay, well, whatever. They'll figure it out sooner or later. I just want you to figure it out now because I care about you. All right, look at this back down here at verse 12. And when I, beheld, when I beheld, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal. Now watch this. And lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. All these guys making a big deal out of blood moons. Just recently, right? Man, they're so stupid. I mean, the religious leaders. I'm talking about the religious leaders that are so stupid. And my heart melts for all the people that don't know any better, just regular people living their lives. They get all wound up and worked up because somebody got them all scared about something, all jacked up about something because they don't know how to rightly divide their Bible. And they make a ton of money, man. They make so much money out of getting you to click and like and listen and buy their books and all the rest of that stuff. They're charlatans and they're frauds. This is in the tribulation period, right before Jesus Christ comes back, right before the second advent. Now, we don't have time to turn there, but write down these verses if you want to look them up. You can write down Matthew chapter 24, verse 29. It shows you that there's heavenly phenomenon taking place right before the second advent, and that's over there in the gospel of Matthew. 
write down Luke 21, 25. Luke 21, 25. Write down Mark 13, verses 24 through 26. This stuff is described to you in the Gospels. And these yahoos then go through the Gospels and they start preaching the kingdom of heaven and they start talking about you better forgive men or your heavenly father won't forgive you and if your eye offends you, pluck it out and if your hand offends you, cut it off. And, and they're trying to, this stuff's all applying to a different time period. It's not applying to now. Jesus came to the Jews preaching to the Jews. They take you to Acts, the book of Acts chapter 1 when the apostle of Peter is preaching, Acts chapter 2, excuse me, and the apostle Peter is preaching and he's talking about some of the same stuff. You know what God did? He said to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, I'm just going to seed you on this and we'll keep moving. Maybe we'll do Acts soon. But here's what I want to just throw out there to you. God gave Israel a second chance after they crucified Jesus Christ. Now, you just, just grab a hold of that the best you can. He gave them a second chance. All the way up till Acts chapter 7, they had a chance. So when Peter is pulling this stuff up, he's telling them what was coming. He was preaching about the second advent. He's preaching about the coming of Jesus Christ to set up his kingdom. Israel stoned Stephen and rejected the gospel again. And after that, the apostle Paul comes into the picture, gets saved and gets a mystery revealed to him that was hidden before that. So these guys tell you they're saved in the Old Testament looking forward to the cross. How are they saved looking forward to something that was hidden? and was revealed to Paul, and when God revealed it to Paul, the other apostles pushed back at him because they didn't get it. They spent three and a half years with Jesus himself and didn't get it. So this overly simplistic view of saved looking forward to the cross, saved looking back at the cross, is a bunch of stinking foolishness, man. You can't make heads or tails out of your Bible like that. They went and they waited for the blood of Jesus Christ to come, and they were saved by their works and faith. And if they died in their sins, they went to hell. Your sins are gone. You're washed clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. You can't go to hell if you want to as a born-again Christian in the New Testament. You better thank God for that because you got a special privilege as the bride of Jesus Christ due to his prayer in John chapter 17 and the Father honoring his request to keep them that they didn't have in the Old Testament. That's why David said, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Saul had an anointing of God and lost it and went to hell. You think about that for a minute. These guys, the, the, you folks, I'm telling you, when you get around a guy that don't believe the Bible and is always telling you, well, in the originals, well, that's a copyist error. Well, the problem is, well, that's a wrong interpretation. You're dealing with the guys that are going to mess you up so bad, you're not going to believe your Bible before long. And if you don't believe the Bible, what is the point in believing anything? Be a good person, make a bunch of money, have a great time, don't hurt nobody because maybe, you know, you want to hedge your bet in case you're going to see a God and hopefully everything will be cool. I ain't living life, my life like that, man. If there's an eternal soul and that, that hellfire is real, I, that's, not, that's not good enough for me. Sorry, you want to do that, that's your life, you do with it what you want, but I, I'm not okay with it. So these other passages are referring to this time period and what's happening right before the second advent is some crazy phenomenon is happening in nature. It tells you right here, the, the sun becomes black as sackcloth of hair, the moon becomes as blood. Now, you imagine how creepy that would be. And then it says, the stars fell of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree cast in her untimely figs when she's shaken of a mighty wind. You ever seen some strange weather patterns building up? What, what are they all saying? They're all saying, oh, global warming, oh, Mother Earth, Mother Nature, we better fix it. Because it's going to get worse. People are going to die. The sun's getting too hot. The ozone layers was a big deal when I was a kid. And they're all ranting and raving about it because they're studying scientifically and they're seeing something's happening. The ozone layer is depleting. Well, God told you the heavens are going to wax old all the way back in Psalms. God told you the heavens were going to wax old. He's telling you the ozone layer is going to deplete. All the way back in Psalms, there was no way a man could have figured that out. There's absolutely no way they had the scientific ability at that time to know it. But God said, here, write this down. He said, all right, God, if you tell me to write it, I'll write it. The weapons are going to wax old. Okay, whatever that means. Sure. And then you look at the Bible and say, oh, that's written by man. Well, you're an idiot. I'm sorry, you're believing something some idiot's telling. You have not, you're judging a book you never studied. And you don't care about your soul or the souls of anybody you love if you're going to be that flippant about something that's that powerful. 
what happens in verse 14. So you got some crazy weather patterns coming and what you're seeing in the world around you right now is a warm up. We're getting close. It's like a pregnancy. They're like Braxton Hicks. And before you know it, the real ones are coming and that's the tribulation period. Because a nation's going to be born in a day and that nation's the nation of Israel. So the tribulation period is that woman in travail. That nation's coming. But it's going to be real painful and real bad before she gets here. And you see it in nature. So don't be so quick to say, oh, they're so stupid about global warming. Well, I hope it is, don't you? You live in Michigan, people. Don't you hope it warms up a little bit? Be all right, wouldn't it? Praise Jesus. You know, we'll, we'll make it through the summers. Everybody else has been. And maybe our winters won't be as bad, you know. <laughs> Why not? If the Lord's coming soon, we might as well have some warm winters before he gets here. Don't be so quick to say they're so wrong. Just be real quick to say they're wrong because it's Mother Nature and what we're doing to the planet. It's what God said is going to happen. That's going to happen in the tribulation, but it, I'm, just, I'm just suggesting you could be seeing a warm-up. We might be getting close. Maybe there's something to what they're seeing. Who knows? The heavens departed together as a scroll when it is, the heavens departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. Ain't that weird? Now, we'll get into it more later. I'll, we'll probably describe to you the shape of the universe. And the way God's going to stay, actually take it and just roll it back. He's the creator of science. Even the winds and the seas obey him. We don't have time tonight. I've got to wrap it up. Heaven departed together. It was rolled as a, uh, as a scroll when it was rolled together. Every mountain and island were moved out of their place. Talking about a great earthquake. That said in verse 12. Mountains and islands are being busted up and sinking out there in the, in the oceans. The kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every freeman hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks, the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And that is the first run through the tribulation period on the briefest level. And we're going to go through it again. Chapter 7 is a parenthetical chapter. So we'll look at chapter 7. We'll start into chapter 7 next week. But let me just say this before you go. Aren't you glad you aren't going to be here? No, Folks, we don't believe in a pre-trib rapture because we made it up. The Bible teaches you that if you're born again, God's getting you out of here before that happens. So if you ain't saved, you need to find out what we're talking about and ask God to speak to your heart and show you the truth. And if you ain't saved, get saved. And if you are saved, well, you need to know this stuff because you need to know your Bible. And God said you'll get a blessing from the study in Revelation. Been a blessing so far? Really? <laughs> that had to be God because what we're looking at ain't so exciting. But the cool thing is, man, years ago people couldn't see this stuff. But I think right now... I think right now, everybody believing a great lie seems a whole lot more realistic than it used to seem when I was a kid. I think right now, some guy showing up in a UFO, stepping off of that thing and saying, I'm Jesus. He sounds crazy. I'm just saying. Seems a whole lot more realistic. Are we looking for life out there? People accepting beings from outer space or accepting morph beings that aren't human seems a whole lot more realistic than it ever used to. So it's exciting times to be alive. Okay, on that happy note, see if you can go win somebody of the Lord this week, all right? Bring them back with you on Wednesday night. Let's go ahead and pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for the promise of the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm so glad, Lord, I don't have to hide myself in a rock or in a den somewhere because I'm afraid of you coming in your wrath. I am so glad I get to look for you in the clouds. And I'm going to go up there and I'm going to meet you. And we're going to head up there and we're going to have a good time, Lord, at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And finally, Lord, finally never having to, never having to deal with my sinful flesh again. Problems of this world. Lord, it's going to be great to get there. I pray you'd help us in the meanwhile while we're here to be faithful, to do right, to put you first, to walk with you, God, to draw closer to you. Bless these people, I pray. Get them home safely. Give them a good week. Bless them on their jobs, Lord. Uh, give them promotions and whatever else you can trust them with. I pray you'd do it for them. I pray you'd bring us back here on Wednesday, Father, and speak to our hearts in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, you're dismissed.